Most of you know that my favorite book of the Bible is Genesis, but my second favorite book of the Bible is Jeremiah. And on this Sunday of the commissioning of Andrew, one of my favorite passages is Genesis, I mean Jeremiah chapter 1. So let me read to you the first 10 verses of Jeremiah chapter 1. If you're using a pew Bible, it's going to be found on page 789. Hear then the word of God. The words of Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah, one of the priests of Anathah in the territory of Benjamin, the word of the Lord came to him in the 13th year of the reign of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. And through the reign of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, down to the fifth month of the 11th year of Zedekiah, son of Josiah, king of Judah, when the people of Jerusalem went into exile. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Ah, sovereign Lord, I said, I don't know how to speak. I am only a child. But the Lord said to me, do not say, I am only a child. You must go to everyone I send you and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I have appointed you over the nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you see, Jeremiah? I see branches of an almond tree, I replied. And the Lord said to me, you have seen correctly, for I am watching to see that my word is fulfilled. Let's pray. Father God, we give you thanks for this morning. We give you thanks for your word. We give you thanks that you speak to us even this day. And so as we listen to your word this morning, Father, we pray that you would give us attentive ears and minds that understand and hearts willing to obey. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Today we're going to take a look at the life of Jeremiah because out of all the prophets in the Old Testament, Jeremiah is probably the most relevant to our contemporary situation here in the U.S. this day. This week, I would ask you to read the entire book of Jeremiah and to read it existentially. And what I mean by that is read it with a sense of personal involvement, applying the situations and the circumstances of the nation Judah to our own nation, and applying, if you dare, the life of Jeremiah to that of your own. Jeremiah received his call from God when he was no older than 20 years of age. Some think he may have been as young as 16 years of age. And we have a record of that call in the first chapter, which we read. Let me read it to you again. Verse 4, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. What God was saying to Jeremiah was, Jeremiah, before you knew who you were, before you knew what you were going to do with your life, I had already ordained a plan for you that you would minister in my name to the nations and to Israel. Let me ask you, in your own life, do you have a sense of the call of God? Do you realize that before you were born, before you were created, God had purposed a plan for your life? 
The scripture gives us that plan, at least in part, in the book of Genesis. God creates man and woman, and as he creates man and woman, he says to them, you are to rule over and subdue the creation in the name of the king. Men and women were created to live in the created order and to open up the creation to all of its potential so that all of creation would give God glory. So now in a fallen world, as God's redeemed children, we're called to once again take up that original task to establish his rule here on earth. Jesus referred to it as the kingdom of God. The rule of God has come in your midst. That's why when Jesus was asked, Lord, teach us to pray, he said, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come on earth. Thy rule come on earth the same way it is in heaven. Lord, your kingdom come here on earth in the same way it's manifested in heaven. Let me share with you four reasons why Jeremiah, why Andrew, why you and I should be thrilled to serve God in this calling. Let me take them in order that they're given to us in this conversation between God and Jeremiah. First, God knew him. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. God took Jeremiah into his loving acquaintanceship. He set his caring eyes upon him. He chose him before he was even formed. And that's true of every child of God. Secondly, God consecrated him. He set him apart, as NIV says. Before you were born, I set you apart. God has set Jeremiah, God has set Andrew, God has set you and I apart for his purposes. He has destined us for something significant. As Christians, part of that destiny is he calls us to be redeemed, to trust Jesus, and then he gifts us. But he separates us so that we would be like Jesus, so that as we work in this world, we bring him glory. Thirdly, God formed Jeremiah in the womb. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. What Jeremiah became through the genetic makeup of his mom and his dad was no accident. God shaped and designed him based on the genetic makeup of his mother and father while he was yet in his mother's womb. If the Lord calls you to do something, it's because he's designed you to do something, even while you were in your mother's womb. Fourthly, God appointed Jeremiah to be a prophet. That's why Jeremiah was born. That's his destiny. And you have one too. No Christian exists merely to make a living and then to retire and die. Everyone, even as Judy has reminded, is called to ministry. Let's go back to our chapter 1 and how Jeremiah responded to the ministry that he was called to. Read verse 6. Ah, sovereign Lord, I said, I don't know how to speak, for I am only a child. Jeremiah was saying, Lord, I can't do it. I'm too young. I don't speak very well. I, I really don't know how to put thoughts and ideas together. I'm young and my, I'm just not very mature. I'm so limited. Listen, Lord, I have a good friend. Well, he's really a friend of a friend. His name happens to be Isaiah. And he is eager to serve you. Why don't you go and talk to Isaiah? 
And what does God say to Jeremiah? Oh, Jeremiah, I'm sorry. I got up rather early this morning, and I, I thought I was talking to Isaiah, and I'm talking to you instead. My mistake. It's all right. I realize I was asking a lot. I know you're shy. I know you can't speak out. I know you don't like warm places. <laughs> I know you can't take a stand. Listen, Jeremiah, I forgot I, who I was issuing the call to. That's all right. I'll tell you what, Jeremiah, you sleep in. You stay nice and cool. I'll find someone else more gifted, more talented. And perhaps this, this guy, Isaiah, that you mentioned, perhaps he can help me. But you go back and you simply pray. I'll find someone else to put their life on the line. Is that what God said to Jeremiah? You know it's not. We find God's response in verse 7. God says to Jeremiah, Don't tell me you're not able. Don't tell me that you're too young. Don't tell me that you're too timid. Don't give me all the excuses that you might come up with. You will do what I tell you to do, and you will speak to whom I send you. And then listen to the task that Jeremiah is given to in verse 10. See, today I have appointed you over the nations and the kingdoms to uproot, to tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. But before Jeremiah could build, before he could plant, Jeremiah faced the unenviable task of plucking up, of breaking down, of destroying, of overthrowing and shaking the people of Israel at their very foundations. Sounds a bit drastic. Breaking down, plucking up, destroying, overthrowing. What's that got to do with ministry? You only understand that task in light of understanding redemption. God in his creation of the world desired that all creation serve him to worship him. He was and is the creator king. And he created man and women to be his vice regents, ones that would rule in the creation in his name. Our task would be kings with a small k to rule over the creation, to rule and subdue it so that all creation, whether it be families, whether it be in the field of education, whether it be in the field of business, whether it be in the field of government, whether it be in the field of science, whether it's in the field of medicine, whether it's in the field of law, whether it's in the field of art and music, or in the field of labor, that all of creation, every area of life, would serve the King of Kings. So that all of creation, every area of life would shout, glory, glory, glory to the Lord. But as a result of sin, man no longer could rule and subdue the creation in the name of the king. The creation no longer served the king. Man used creation to serve himself. Therefore, the creation no longer reflected the glory and the majesty of the Lord God. But God had a plan, a plan of redemption, a plan to redeem man and the creation. The promise to Adam and Eve of a seed, Genesis 3.15, seed from the woman who would crush the head of the serpent, the promise to Abraham of a nation, of a covenant people who trusted him for their salvation, and they would live their lives in obedience to him, and they would become the live model here on earth of what was happening in heaven. 
That was God's desire for Israel, that they would be the live model here on earth of what was happening in heaven. They were to be a people set apart. And so God gave them norms of how they might be a people set apart and be distinctive from the rest of the world. He gave them the Ten Commandments, but he also gave them laws concerning the family. He gave them laws concerning marriage relationships. He gave them laws concerning land use. He gave them laws concerning lending and borrowing. He gave them laws concerning education. He gave them laws concerning health and medicine. Why all these laws? Because God desired all of life, each area of life, to reflect his kingship. And so Paul writes in Colossians that God, through Jesus, is reconciling all things to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven. And so what does Jesus do when he arrives? He preaches the gospel, the good news that he is Lord of all, and he heals the sick and raises the dead as evidence that he is the king of creation. And Jesus sends out the 70, and he says, heal those who are sick and say to, the God, and say to them, the kingdom of God, the rule of God has come. And when the disciples return, they say, even the demons were subject to us in your name. And what does Jesus say? I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. The rule of God was being established as they became obedient to Jesus, and Satan no longer holds sway over people's lives. Part of the plan of redemption is that Satan will no longer have his way in the creation. And Jesus comes with the power to reclaim the creation and establish his kingship, and it begins by reclaiming us and redeeming us. But it doesn't end there. When Jesus came, he came to do battle with the principalities and the powers that are loose within the creation. And that's why Paul writes, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against the rulers, against the world forces of darkness and the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. That's the battle. So as God's people, we're locked in warfare. And the question is one of allegiance. Are we loyal to the principalities in power? Are we loyal to the spirits that are at work in this age? Or are we loyal to Jehovah God? Getting back to our text in verse 10 and what verse 10 means. Israel, as God's people, had prostituted itself and become loyal in their norms for living to the gods of their day. Now, they still worship Jehovah God. They still went to the temple to worship God, but their lives were not driven by surface to him. They were driven by the spirits of the world. And so they were still God's people in the sense that they went to church every Sunday. But they weren't practicing his kingship in all the other areas of their life. So Jeremiah, at this point in Israel's history, prior to their captivity by the Babylonians, is saying, God must destroy, God must break down, God must overthrow those ways of living, those structures within the creation that although appearing to be normal, in reality are opposed to the lordship of kingship of Christ in all of life. And so where does God send Jeremiah? Does God send Jeremiah to the Wall Street of the day? Does God send Jeremiah to the business leaders of the day? Does God send Jeremiah into the marketplace? No, he does not. Jeremiah is sent by God to Jerusalem to the central sanctuary where all the people 
gathered to give their traditional thanks and worship to the Lord. Because it's just not the case in Israel's case, and I would suggest in ours, that the culture is sick unto death. But God's people, too, have succumbed to the harlots of this world. So when you turn to Jeremiah chapter 7, the people are gathered in church. They're gathered in the temple. And they're chanting. They're worshiping. They're singing their songs. And they're saying, this is the temple of the Lord. The temple of the Lord. The temple of the Lord. And in the middle of their worship service, Jeremiah comes in and he interrupts them. And he says to them, to the people of God, you say this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. You trust in lying words. You don't speak the truth. Your words have no profit. You commit yourself to things less worthy than myself, and then you have the audacity to come in and say, this is the temple of the Lord? See, they were coming to church, and they were saying, Jehovah God reigns. He's king of kings and lord of lords, but they were going out from the church and spending the rest of their week living according to the standards of the world. So Jeremiah says, you go to look at Shiloh, which was the former sanctuary of Israel, which God had destroyed because of their harlotry with the world. He says, Jerusalem is going to look just like Shiloh unless you repent and worship God with your heart and not just your lips that you worship God by doing, by getting out there in the world and doing, and not just playing religion. We hear Jesus saying the same thing when Jesus says, these people, they worship me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Jeremiah went to the kings of Judah and he called the kings of Judah to repentance. He went to Pasher and handed him a list of oracles against the people of God. He read them off. And he said, this is the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. And Pasher had Jeremiah beaten and put in the stockades. Jeremiah is going to the people of God and calling them to repentance. And he's beaten and put in prison. Do you think Jeremiah enjoyed his role in ministry? Do you think Jeremiah enjoyed ministering to the people of God? Do you not think Jeremiah was human, that he wanted people to like him and care for him? Jeremiah was a lonely man. Jeremiah was a broken man. By the scholars who study Jeremiah, he's known as the weeping prophet because in the midst of his writings, he cries out, would that my head be water and my eyes fountain of tears that I might weep day and night for my people who perish. I've been here 18 years ministering with you and will continue to ministering under Andrew's leadership. But in those 18 years, I've always wanted us to be a people of passion, a people who refuse to cover up our pain and struggles with Christian discipleship, a people who refuse to look away from the pain of others and the brokenness of our culture. And so I'm calling us once again to be a people who weep and mourn for those who are lost, for those who are oppressed, for those who suffer, and to cry out even as Jeremiah cried out. Because when we cry out, it's empowering. 
because the person we cry out to is the Lord God who can and does act as his people have a passion and zeal that he has and a love that he has for people who are lost and broken and suffering. Jeremiah loved God and man more than he loved himself. I don't know of anyone like that today. But Jeremiah, because he was human, Jeremiah grew tired. And Jeremiah went to God in chapter 20, and he tries to quit. He says, Lord, you have deceived me, and I have been deceived. Lord, you called me to minister to your people. And I thought when you called me to minister to your people, people would listen. People would want to follow you. People would want to obey you. And Lord, I've done all that you asked me to do. And all I did was get laughed at and beaten and I put into prison. So Jeremiah, tired from ministry, said, Lord, I've had enough. I'm turning in my prophet's card. I quit. You go get yourself a new man. But there was a secret that drove the prophet Jeremiah. And you find it in verse 9 of chapter 20. Then the word of the Lord came to me. And the word of the Lord became a fire within my bones. And I could not stop. I could not quit. The Lord had changed Jeremiah and placed his word, his spirit within him so that the Lord's relationship with Jeremiah had penetrated the very marrow of his bone. And when he wanted to quit, he couldn't. Because God was at work in his life and Jeremiah couldn't stop and the Lord would not allow him to stop. Let me share with Andrew and with you three reasons Jeremiah and we should always be encouraged when the Christian life and ministry to the world and to each other gets tough. And it does. And it will for Andrew. Three reasons. One, our life is rooted in God's sovereignty. The first reason Jeremiah should be encouraged, that we should be encouraged to take up ministry, is that our very lives are rooted in the unshakable, sovereign purses, person of God. Before you were born, I knew you. You are not your own. You belong to God. You are not self-made, you are God-made. You did not first choose me, I chose you. Second, the second reason God gives to young Jeremiah that he should overcome his fearful objections is that God's authority is behind his going. You find it in verse 7 of chapter 1. Do not say, I am only a youth, for to all to whom I send you, you shall go, and whoever I command you, you shall speak. The emphasis here is on the Lord's sending. It wasn't Jeremiah's idea to go. This is God's plan. God's sending and God's commanding. Jeremiah's youth or whatever other excuse Jeremiah or we come up with does not matter. If God commissions, if God sends, if God commands, then his authority is behind what we're doing and we go. Thirdly, the third reason God gives Jeremiah not to be deterred from ministry is that God will be with him and in the difficult times, God will deliver him and deliver us. Verse eight, do not be afraid of them for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. The greatest obstacle in serving the Lord, I think, 
is fear. There's a fear of rejection, fear of opposition. All kinds of thoughts enter our mind about how some people might not like the way I do something. People might disagree. I might accidentally offend people. I might make a mistake and get criticized. The fear of man is of great hindrance. So God says, don't be afraid because I will be with you and I will deliver you. So God's presence and approval is more valuable than that of the accolades of man. God says that in and through all your troubles, I will deliver you. And so God says to Jeremiah, God says to Andrew and to each of us today, to whom he is calling to serve, don't say I'm a youth or don't offer any excuse that you can think of of not ministering, for I've called you. And why should I be confident of that calling? Because your life is rooted in the unshakable sovereign purses of God. Secondly, because God's authority, not yours, is behind your going. And thirdly, because God himself will be with you to deliver you in the midst of all of your trials. Let me close with this observation. It's not just Andrew who we are commissioning today. Today is a day when we all need to reflect on our own commissioning, on our own calling. 1 Peter chapter 2 reminds us that we are a chosen race. We are a royal priesthood. You are priests, according to the scriptures. You have a calling as priests. And what do priests do? They conduct the ministry of reconciliation that Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. You have a ministry of reconciliation. You don't have to guess whether or not you are called to ministry. You are called to ministry. All Christians are called to some form of ministry. For Andrew, it's the pastoral ministry, but for others, it's a ministry of hospitality. It's the ministry of caring for shut-ins. For moms and dads, it's the ministry of raising a family. For others, it's the ministry of bearing witness to others in the place of their employment. For others, it's the ministry of taking care of those who are hungry, those who lack shelter, those who lack economic means to care for themselves. For others, it's perhaps the opportunity to travel abroad for a short-term missionary work to places like Haiti or Philippines. For Dottie and I, it's the ministry to children from other nations who are 8,000 miles away from their moms and dads. We're all called to be instruments of God to break down the strongholds of Satan, whether those strongholds are in schools, churches, corporate structures, government, the legal system, family, and all of life, so that all of life, once again, brings glory to God. So where has God called you? That's a question we ought to pray about. We know where God has called Andrew, but God has called all of you to serve the King of Kings, to serve the Lord of Lords. Let's pray. Father God, as we come before you, we're humbled because sometimes our view of the church is so myopic. We think it's just about Sunday worship. And while our time here is so critically important to our own growth and our relationship with you, you from the foundations of the earth had designed the creation, our lives to give you glory. And you've called us now as redeemed boys and girls, as redeemed men and women to be out into the world proclaiming the good news and to tearing down those structures that do not give honor and glory to you and erecting signposts that the kingdom has come. 
and yet we feel so unequipped. And yet your scriptures this morning have told us, do not be afraid. So help us, Father, this morning. Help us to not be afraid. Help us to trust you as we go out into the world. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask Andrew to come down. I'm going to ask... Yes, yes, yeah, please, please. <clears throat> I'm going to ask the elders to come down as well. And Josue. I'm going to ask Andrew's dad, who's also an elder, to come down. Josue, did you have a Bible verse you wanted to read? Yes, I do. specific instruction we have to serve God. And that applies to Andrew, but also applies to each one of us. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourself. Never be lacking in seal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful patient in affliction, faithful in prayer, share with, one another, share with those people who are in need, practice hospitality, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse, rejoice with those who, re rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn, live in harmony with one another, do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friend, but leave room for God's wrath. When it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will be contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will hit burning coal on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask Andrew um, uh, a series of questions, um, and Andrew is going to respond, I do so believe. On the last one, you're going to respond, I will, the Lord being my helper. All right. Andrew, do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior, acknowledging him as Lord of all and head of the church? And through him, believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If so, say, I do so believe. I do so believe. Andrew, do you believe in your heart that you are called by God's church and therefore by God? be a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ? If so, say, I do so believe. I do so believe. Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testament to be, by the Holy Spirit, the infallible, inerrant word of God, authoritative in all of life? If so, I do so believe. I do so believe. Will you proclaim the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Will you, from the word of God, instruct, admonish, comfort, and reprove, according to everyone's needs, and uphold the witness of Holy Scripture against all schisms and heresies. If so, say, I will, the Lord being my helper. I will, the Lord being my helper. And will you fulfill your ministry in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture and be continually guided by the historic confessions of the church? If so, say, I do so believe. I do so believe. And will you be governed by the church elders and will you abide by their instruction, guidance, and discipline if so, say, I will, the Lord being my helper. I will, the Lord being my helper. Don has three questions that he's going to ask the congregation. And Don will tell you what your response. 
ought to be. <laughs> the response we're looking for the congregation will say we do. The first question, do we, the members of the church, accept Andrew Bermuda as our pastor, chosen by God through the voice of its elders to guide us in the way of Jesus Christ? Yes. Do we agree to pray for him, to encourage him, to respect his decisions, and to follow as he guides us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is the head of the church? Yes. Do we promise to pay him fairly and provide for his welfare as he works among us, to stand by him in trouble and to share his joy, we will welcome his pastoral care and honor his authority as we seek to honor and obey Jesus Christ our Lord. Yes. I'm going to ask Andrew if you'll kneel down, and the elders are going to lay hands on you, and I will pray for you. You guys come on up. Let's pray. Gracious God, pour out your spirit upon your servant, Andrew, whom you've called as your own. Grant him the same mind that was in Christ Jesus. Give him the gifts of your Holy Spirit to build up the church, to strengthen the common life of your people, and to lead with compassion and vision. In the walk of faith and for the work of ministry, give to your servant, Andrew, and to all who serve as elders and deacons among your people, gladness and strength, discipline and hope, humility, humor and courage, and an abiding sense of your presence. Bless, we pray, this new call, O oh God, this call between Andrew and the people of the First Baptist Church in Dexter. Grant them your Holy Spirit as they together seek the mind of Christ and work to do Christ's mission and ministry in this community and beyond. Give them joy in their service together, fruitfulness in their common ministry, and faithfulness in their mission. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, and the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Amanda, your presence has been requested. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Josue, would you like to pray for both of them? I believe the Lord knows.